Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Dave and Axel to uh, invite me, and uh, certainly always a pleasure to be uh, standing against uh, one of the giants of colorectal cancer, my friend Axel Grothy. Uh, although this one actually I think is easy uh, <laughs> for me. I think if, if you notice the whole presentation that Axel presented is primarily out of desperation because he knows <laughs> he's going to lose this one. <laughs> Tell you what, it's favored. Now, you know, uh, we, we know that tumor mutation load is, is very important and a great predictor for uh, uh, immune therapy effectiveness in, color, in cancer in general. And nowhere other than in colorectal cancer that you see almost 100% overlap between MSI high and TMB or TML high. And that's very important to keep in mind. And that's why it's a great MSI high, is a great predictor for response for these PD1 inhibitors. So the, the pivotal study that essentially led to the approval of pembrolizumab first in uh, uh, MMR deficient colorectal cancer was this study, um, small, small study, but still uh, uh, meaningful, with uh, three cohorts focusing on cohort A and B, uh, with the MMRD deficient and the proficient uh, MMRP colorectal cancer. These were heavily pretreated patients, uh, and <clears throat> what you see with pembrolizumab is essentially a response rate of close to 60% in a, in a very refractory patient population. Uh, mind you that this was essentially uh, after nine months of follow-up. So a lot of these, you know, continue to be follow-up through. I'll show you that in the next slide. 11% uh, complete response rate, I mean CRs, uh, and a PR of 46%. In fact, the progressors were about 4%. That's about it. Uh, and uh, the median progression free survival at the time was not reached, the same for overall survival. Uh, when you look at the tumor markers, so the biomarkers, they seem to plummet very quickly to almost nothing, meaning, you know, normalized uh, in colorectal cancer with the, uh, uh, with the deficient mismatch repair patients. Uh, pretty impressive drops. In fact, in a lot of these patients get resolution of their symptoms very quickly. And you can see the, 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 the waterfall plot, <clears throat> which is actually more impressive when you look at the beyond 20 weeks. So in blue, that C is the 20-week response rate. As you can see, as you follow these tumors with time, uh, those tumors continue to shrink. The reality is most of it is dead tumors, it's just you know, these masses on the scans that shrivel away uh, to oblivion. And interestingly, even at that long-term follow-up, median PFS was not reached yet, and median overall survival was not reached yet. I mean, this is pretty impressive. This is 36 months after half of the patients have not even progressed, and actually about 70% of the patients are still alive. So I'm not actually going to present much uh, the data that was presented by Heinz Joseph Lenz in the first line. Uh, it was already presented, so I'm not going to waste much time on it. But what I'll show you is that nivolumab has relatively similar activity, although historically seems to be less performant than pembrolizumab, but that's historic. Of course, we can't compare those. You'd see similar trends. With nevo, it's probably preferable to add ipilimumab in, in, in colorectal cancer. You see more responses uh, and, and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, improve outcomes. So I'm going to go back to the same uh, uh, paper that uh, Axel showed you. You know, I have a different take on this study. I, I'm actually surprised that this study was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. I think the only reason why it was because it had CLGB80405 on it. In fact, you know, hmm? And swag. I'm sorry, but that's not a compliment right now for this paper. Uh, the, the, the reality is th there wasn't even a mention of who are those patients with MSI high who actually received PD-1 inhibitors. Nowhere, I don't know actually if you've seen that, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I was surprised that a reviewer actually would look at this and would not ask the question, is this actually an if a tail effect because patients were exposed to PD-1 inhibitors with an imbalance or not? Not, not there. So I'm not sure that that's a true effect. In fact, the sister journal, Journal of Precision Oncology, <clears throat> tells a different story. You know, albeit this is uh, uh, an 87 patient study, which by the way is larger than the CLGB SWOG report, which shows, and this is from Northern Israel, uh, which shows that when you look at 5-FU versus combination therapy versus combination therapy and chemotherapy and the MSI high BRF wild type, so those are the better performers of the MSI high, no effect from chemotherapy BEV versus chemotherapy. 
More so, when you look at the microsatellite stable cohort versus the microsatellite uh, uh, MSI high, it seems for the MSS, as you would expect, combination chemotherapy does better than 5-FU only, where our MSI high does not seem to actually pull any benefit from combination versus 5-FU. So, you know, that actually counters the argument that chemotherapy makes much of a difference in those patients. I'm going to go quickly through two cases just to illustrate why it's important to consider immune therapy first line. This is actually published in Britain Medical Journal, 42-year-old 42, 42 woman with stage 3 KRAS mutant, uh, mutant G, G13D, um, had an emergency sigmoid resection due to perforation, had adjuvant Xelox, uh, did okay and then progressed pretty massively in the, in the, in the valley, uh, had fulfiria when she progressed, but that didn't seem to touch her tumor. She was ECOC performance status of three, incapable to walk, so she was on a wheelchair. And they then decided to do a molecular profile, showed a mismatch uh, repair deficiency, and then uh, patients were started on pembrolizumab. After 11 cycles, her tumor went by half. I mean, look how big that tumor is in figure one, and it went by half. In fact, within four to eight weeks, the patient was able to walk gained back her appetite, her performance status was almost zero, as reported in this. I'm going to actually show you a case from my own uh, clinic, the 64-year-old, again, sigmoid obstructing tumor, had an LAR, was found to have M1B disease, was placed on Folfox. This patient was admitted to the hospital on a weekly basis uh, because of progression, ultimately had a PET-CT, showed progressive disease everywhere in the belly. I mean, her ascites was massive. I'd say the patient who had a performance status of three to four. Now, I didn't see her until then. I found out that MSI was not checked, which now, you know, would be a crime, literally, not to check MSI high. We did MSI. <clears throat> it was high. Uh, I saw her actually in the hospital. I, cu I couldn't even see her in the clinic. I sent her to the hospital and went to see her to the hospital. After we had the results, I said, if you can actually make it out of the hospital within the week, I'm going to treat you with pembrolizumab, or I still think hospice is reasonable. I don't typically do that for most patients, but in this situation, you know, with the MSI high, I thought she needed to be get, given a chance. Within three weeks, she was back active. Actually, her ascites surprising was completely resolved by then, and she's currently in CR. It took 40 weeks to have a radiographic CR, but this was her CA response, her clinical response just zoop, down. Incredible uh, just uh, response. Every time I see her, she just looks wonderful. All right, so. I want to quote something that I heard a few years ago from one of my good friends here, Dr. Ilson. When I heard this, I actually used this a lot. Does the punishment fit the crime? This was a discussion with DCF versus CF, I, if I remember well. I thought this was very insightful because that tells us, should we really punish our patients? Should we think a little bit more about what makes sense to our patients? Let me make the case for immunotherapy if I haven't done that yet for first, uh, uh, first in MSI high colorectal cancer. PD-1 inhibitor, you know, my preference usually is from pembrolizumab, but if you, you choose nivolumab, perhaps consider ipilimumab, induces the equivalent of a cure in 40 to 50 percent of patients. I mean, those are, those are the curve, the, the PFS curves, at least with pembro, hasn't hit the median. Chemotherapy does not. PD-1 inhibitors are safe with durable benefits beyond discontinuation. Chemotherapy is not. The two cases illustrate potential missed opportunities and wasted time on chemo, frankly, for those patients. I mean, imagine if those patients actually never made it to these PD-1 inhibitors. They'd be dead. They wouldn't even be uh, at this point alive and, and without evidence of disease. More than 40 percent of patients with MSI high colorectal cancer treated in first line may never see chemotherapy. I mean, they may never see chemotherapy. That's not bad. Know the, pa the only patient on chemotherapy, that's the, the, the discussion, that never sees a PD-1 inhibitor is the one that actually misses the opportunity. So don't let this happen to your next patient with MSI, metastatic colorectal cancer, and make sure everyone has the opportunity to have it. So bring it to first line. Thank you.